All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Dad and I uh, are here today, and we are um, presenting to you lesson number 10, for the Letters of Paul, Part 1, for the Adult School of Ministry Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November the 8th. 2020. It's hard to believe we're already uh, on this the 10th Sunday of the quarter. We have three more Sundays to go. And um, oh, by the way, let me make this announcement. I have the new material in. So in the next week or two, uh, if you want to come by the office and pick up your new quarterly for the next quarter, which will start uh, in December, then uh, please go ahead and bring that. The last Sunday uh, and this quarter will be the last Sunday of November, which is the 29th of November. So the very first Sunday in December, we'll start the new quarter. And I have those books already here in my office. So if you want to come by the office and pick those up, uh, please do so. Uh, I will also email the Sunday School class about that, coming by and picking up your book. Uh, we want to make some announcements before we go into the lesson and, and prayer this morning. Remember that we have membership class on Saturday, the 21st of this month from 9 to 9. We have two open uh, spots available for the membership class. If you're interested, uh, please sign up in the lobby. Also, uh, if you're a foster parent or would like to learn more about that and or a foster parent that needs support, we ask that you contact Amanda Rochelo, uh, making life disciples here at the church, and we, you can contact the office and we'll get you her uh, contact information. Also remember that tomorrow, November the 7th, is our monthly uh, clothes, uh, clothing closet giveaway uh, with Pastor Terry at 525 Industrial Park Drive at Campus 2. That will begin at 11 a.m. and run through 3 p.m. Uh, also, parent-child dedication will be offered on Sunday, November the 15th, and uh, that will be uh, here uh, in the church sanctuary. Uh, if you're interested, please register for that um, and in the lobby sign up so we can get that book uh, material to you. Make it, sorry, checking my mic, make sure I turn my mic on. Uh, also, uh, church chaplaincy, which was previously scheduled for this past Sunday, which was canceled because of Jack's father's passing, will be this Sunday, November the 8th at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Mask and social distancing remains a mandate for the meeting, and there will be individually wrapped snacks and things that are provided. Uh, and also, uh, you'll be continuing your uh, Christmas carol preparation for, your, uh, for the holiday season. We also need volunteers for the door hanging project. Uh, we're going to be passing out several thousand prayer door hangers in all of the communities around the church. We'll be doing that on Friday the 13th and Saturday the 14th of November. We're going to pass them out and be in the neighborhoods between 10 a.m. and noon. But if you'd like to help or volunteer, we ask that you show up uh, at 9.30 each day uh, on the 13th and 14th in the Kids Sanctuary and uh, receive some instructions and prayer before you do that. Also, uh, it is Operation Christmas Child time once again. It's time to pack shoe boxes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to pack a shoe box this year to bless a child across the world, and of course, obviously, we're spreading the good news of Jesus Christ by doing that, uh, then empty shoe boxes can be picked up in the church lobby from November 8th, which is Sunday, through the next Sunday, the 15th. Then you drop off your boxes, your filled boxes, you drop them off in the kids' sanctuary on uh, Monday the 16th through Monday the 23rd. So you can pick up starting the 18th through the 15th, I mean the 8th through the 15th, and then you start returning your, your completed or your full boxes on the 16th through the 23rd. Uh, when you do that between the 16th and 23rd, drop off is only between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m., so remember that. And then also, if you're a member of WOW, and you're in need of a Thanksgiving basket this year, then we ask that you please sign up in the lobby no later than the 18th of, the, of this month. So today is the uh, 6th, so you've got 12 days to sign up for that. Also, uh, you can contact Pastor Terry Council in the Benevolence Ministry at 369-4893 with any questions. Also, again this year, uh, because of COVID, uh, our, uh, our Hope Charitable uh, services 
and Hope Charitable Ministries in Portsmouth is in dire need. This is the ministry to the poor, the ministry to the homeless. And, um, and so this will be the 28th annual uh, Hope Drive, and that's where we collect uh, 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 gently used or new coats, uh, various things like that. So here's, let me read it so I don't miss anything. Please consider donating lightly used and or clean coats, hats, gloves, blankets, unwrapped toys, new, and non-perishable food items. Please, we cannot accept clothing at this time. So it's donating lightly used or new coats that are cleaned, coats, hats, gloves, blankets, unwrapped toys, and non-perishable food items, okay? All right, the donation uh, collection points or the donation baskets will be in the lobby. Right now, they're sitting in my office, and they'll be in the lobby Sunday morning uh, for you to make those donations. We will collect all through the month, the rest of the month of November, up through the Sunday of November the 29th, and then the donations will be picked up the following week after that Sunday. So... A lot's going on. Please check uh, the online bulletin. It's on our website uh, if you have any questions. We want to pray and ask the Lord to, to uh, bless today. We have quite a few that um, have, um, uh, are in hospital or urgent physical needs. And uh, it's such a long list, I'm probably going to forget somebody. Um, I do want you to, to uh, pray uh, for... Um, Percy Quinn, who had major reconstructive surgery this week. He's doing much better. He's home now, recovering. Uh, we've had a couple others who ha are facing surgery um, in the next few days between now and next Friday. Um, my daughter-in-law, Brooke, is going through some real physical issues right now. Uh, also, uh, we want to pray for Ellie Taylor. Ellie is still having some trouble with breathing in her lungs and gone through a lot of testing. I talked with Ray this week, and Ray said that they, all the testing, they still cannot find why Ellie still has small blood clots in her lungs. But, uh, uh, but she's doing okay, but just needs a real touch of the Lord. Continue that the, whatever is causing these blood clots, just go in the name of Jesus. Um, we got a request today on the prayer request line from the Laferge family. They have an extended family member out of the area that has COVID, and we want to uh, pray for them. And then. Um, uh, remember Jack Smith and his family, his sister, and the loss of his dad. We had uh, his dad's memorial service uh, also. So anyway, just pray that uh, protection uh, over all the House of Wow and all our various members and congregants and protection from COVID. I want to pray for our nation. Amen. And um, I, I want to give you a word of encouragement today. Uh, do not look at the news with Amen. fear and trepidation, Amen. anxious or anxiety, our, our trust and our focus should be in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and what He can do. Uh, don't believe everything you see, don't believe everything you read, but you can trust the Word of God, you can trust in Christ. He says that our peace is in Him. Hallelujah. And so yeah. we, we fully and completely trust the Lord and everything is in His hands and in His control Amen. Amen. and uh, nothing escapes his notice. Amen. Okay? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, mm. Lord, for um, your oh, blessing hallelujah. upon us yes, as a Lord. nation. We thank you, Father, Lord, and we, we have repented, Father, Lord, Praise and we continue to you, repent Jesus. before you for our sin. Yes, Father, Lord, Lord for uh, the unborn mm. uh, lives that have been taken over these 40 plus years now with this new law, this law mm. of uh, 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 anti- uh, or, uh, anti life. And we, we pray, Father Lord, that the, the, the progress that's been made will continue to be made, oh, Father Lord. God, yes, we look to yes. you, Father Lord, for hope. We look to mm. you for encouragement. We yes, look to Lord. you. We yes. know, Father Lord, that, that you made, you keep every Hallelujah. promise you make. And Hallelujah. we thank you, Father Lord, that you have kept all your promises and there are promises Amen. yet to be fulfilled. And we are excited because yes. we know that they will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. And Father Lord, uh, we, we put our focus in you. And Father Amen. Lord, we serve Lord. you. Amen. And Father Lord, we know that you put 
uh, men and women in places yes. of authority. And Father, Lord, your will will be accomplished. And Father, we give you praise and yes, we thank Lord. you in advance. We pray for Ellie Taylor. We pray for Hersey Quinn. We pray for Brooke Rush. We pray for Philomena Reed and the loss of her family member. We pray, Lord, that you would touch and bless uh, Jack and Sue and Linda and uh, their family and the loss of their dad. Yes, we pray, Lord. Father, that you administer to mm. others on the prayer list, Lord, uh, the Lafarge mm. family that has a member who has COVID. We just pray, Father, mm. for every name on our prayer yes. list, everyone, yes. Father, Lord, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. We pray, God, that Touch you would bring these, healing Father. and restoration. Yes. We pray, Holy Spirit, you calm any fear, Hallelujah. anxiety, Father, yes, Lord, Lord, about what's going on in our nation, COVID and or elections. It, it doesn't matter. Father, Lord, we know All that you hands, are Lord. in control. Amen, and we put amen. our faith and our trust in you and you alone. Amen, we give you amen, praise. Lord. We ask God you touch this lesson today as we look at the writings of Paul uh, there and uh, this lesson and next week's lessons, part one and part two. We pray, God, that you'd give us insight Hallelujah. into the writings of Paul, Father Lord, into the principles of the word that we yes. can apply in our life right now today. Yes. And we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you thanks for all that's mm. accomplished and Hallelujah. will be accomplished in your name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. As I said uh, for the last several weeks, we've noticed that, that this is a uh, series of lessons in this quarter on the stories of the Old and New Testaments. We had seven lessons on the story of the Old Testament and now six lessons on the story of the New Testament. So obviously we're summing up major themes of the scriptures Old and New Testament, and so we have to approach it from a survey perspective. Good. And so we're looking at multiple <clears throat> passages of Scripture in each lesson. We're doing that today. We're going to look at several passages in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Galatians. In the uh, lesson today, as I mentioned, uh, Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament. He wrote 13. Uh, maybe 14 if you consider Hebrews. Mm -hmm. He wrote so many of the, New the books and letters of the New Testament that we're looking at the letters of Paul, his writings, in two lessons. So part one, part two. The themes that we're going to address today are three, and that he's talking about being made right with God, which is uh, a theme of justification, salvation, reconciliation mm -hmm. in the book of Romans. We're also going to look at how he gives correction and counsel to the church, where we're looking at apostolic correction, apostolic counsel, and we're seeing this in both the uh, book of uh, uh, Corinthians and Galatians. And then thirdly, the, the other thing that we want to talk about is the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this we see discussed in several places, but the most prominent location in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's also in Thessalonians uh, as well, and we'll look at that next week. But uh, as we said, author, uh, the Apostle Paul is the author of 13 of the 27 books or letters of the New Testament. We know that all of Paul's writings were letters. That's why we're using that term today. They were all letters that he had written, and, uh, and he had sent them to either churches or individuals. Yes. Now, uh, in this survey lesson, we're going to look at three of Paul's letters, one to the Cor uh, Christians in Rome, or the book of Romans, one to the Christians in Corinth, 1 Corinthians, and then also uh, Paul's letter to uh, the uh, Christians in the area of Galatia. Now, uh, Rome is a city. It's the imperial capital city. Uh, Corinth is a city in southern Greece. Galatia is a province. It's not a city. It's a provincial area, which would be in the south central area of Asia Minor or in the modern day country of Turkey today, uh, or really, really south and, well, actually even middle, uh, uh, just say middle Turkey, middle uh, uh, Asia Minor, and uh, multiple churches in that area. So these letters we know were written to these churches, congregations, and or churches, the Galatians, was written to a provincial area. So that meant that it was a circular letter. 
it had to be passed from church to church, okay? And so we know that uh, all of these are, are letters that Paul has written. And what is uh, unique about the letter to the Romans is that it is a profound explanation on the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, it, uh, Romans, as we're studying on Wednesday night, uh, Romans is a powerful epistle, uh, and it is a very doctrinal epistle where Paul really explains justification uh, through grace by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, which is what we call 1 Corinthians, uh, is filled with also filled with doctrinal and practical information, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, also, uh, in, in essence, some people, Bible scholars, call the letter to the uh, Christians at Galatia, it's often referred to as the many or the little Romans letter. So in, in writing to the church at Galatians, uh, to the Galatian Christians and the churches there in that area, it, it, he repeats some of the same thematic material out of Romans. And so they often frequently call it the, the letter to the Romans in miniature. Okay. All right. Now, the focus on the three lessons and the three letters in the New Testament as authored by the Apostle Paul. We said that already, but we say authored by Paul. Uh, we say that cautiously. It, it's, it came from him, his mind, and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon him. However, we know for a fact that he did not write many of the letters himself. So in other words, he dictated, by under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he dictated the letters to a scribe someone that would write for him or to an assistant who would actually write them for him. In point of time, Paul's letter to the Galatians in A.D. 52, along with his two letters to the Thessalonians in A.D. 50-51, we, they were the first writing. So, that's, and, it, and if you remember in our Pauline Epistles class on Wednesday night, we actually started, we're teaching uh, about the Pauline Epistles, but we're looking at them in... Uh, the letter of writing. We're looking at them in chronological order. Right. They're not in chronological order in the scriptures, right. in the right. New Testament. Right. So we're studying them in chronological order from the time in which he first wrote. So we studied First and Second Thessalonians first, then Galatians. Now notice that, that there are five years uh, passed before Paul's next set of letters. So you've got First and Second Thessalonians and Galatians between 50 and 52 A.D., and then he waits five years, and then we see the next set of letters that are written. And those are the uh, letters to the Corinthians, uh, also to those uh, in uh, Ephesus. And uh, we also know that he writes uh, Romans and uh, several other letters. But in, in that, in that he, he writes three, skips about five years, and then writes a group of other letters. Is there any under, <clears throat> excuse me, any understanding, Mr. Rush, about why that he waited five years before well, writing? Some of it had to do with the timing of his missionary journeys. Correct. So okay. before he could write to some of the churches, he had to visit them the first time. Okay. So some of it was in regard to his his trips, traveling, missionary journeys, and mm -hmm. so uh, um, he couldn't write a letter to a church he hadn't visited yet. So right. it was basically waiting on the, the timing of his missionary journeys. Okay. Yeah. Um, we also know that um, uh, he wrote letters from one city to another church mm -hmm. in other cities. And mm -hmm. so uh, 1 Corinthians was written and sent to the Corinthians while he was visiting the city of Ephesus. We also know, and that was in A.D. 57. We also know that later Paul traveled to Corinth where he wrote to the, the, the letter of, to the Romans. So he was in Corinth. He's at Ephesus when he writes Corinthians. He's in Corinth when he writes Romans. Okay? All right? So that tells you something. Paul was a multitasker. Okay? Yeah. Paul was a multitasker. He could right. do many things at one time. So right. he's governing the church. He's praying for all the churches and believers everywhere, as some of his language says. He's ministering on missionary journeys. Right. Uh, he, he's writing letters to places he's already been to see how they're doing and checking up on them. He's looking forward to establishing churches in new areas he's not been. So obviously he's mapping out and waiting upon the Holy Spirit to tell him where to go next Correct. and what to do. And so he's got all of that. Plus he's got a team that he's working yes. with, assistants yes. that's working with him. On top of that, he's working and doing his own living. 
and making his own expenses right. and his own wherewithal. So, right. so Paul's a, a, a multitasker. Okay, so some of us, we could probably relate to Paul. <laughs> All right, now, in the lesson today, we want to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 17 down to 23, and then we're going to go over to uh, chapter 3, verses 20 through 24. And when we do that, we're going to read some passages that are very familiar to us, and no doubt you know these passages because many of you have learned the Romans road to salvation. So you're going to hear some things that are familiar. When we look at Romans chapter 1 verse 17, it says this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. Okay? So we're, the good news is the gospel. Go back to verse 16. He says, "For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile." This good news, meaning the gospel about Christ, tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. So Paul is immediately addressing thoughts about salvation specifically to the Jew because their thoughts were based on the law right. and observance to the law and obedience to the law would make them right and he's going to negate that. But he also then says that also to the Gentile that it's not through any idol worship that you'll find it either. It's mm -hmm. only going to be by faith in Christ. And he says in the latter part of verse 17, as the scriptures say, it is through faith that a person, a righteous person, has life. So when you look at the latter portion of verse 17, Paul is quoting the scriptures. Now, again, I, I asked this last week on a, on a quote from Paul, uh, but what scripture does Paul have before him to quote? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. It's not the New Testament he's quoting. Right, right. The New Testament's still being experienced. Right. Okay. So it is the Old Testament. And so we know the, here that he is actually uh, quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Okay. So he's doing this. So this is a quotation. He says, and then from, uh, from Habakkuk, again, King James, it says, The just shall live by his faith, all right? The just shall live by his faith, all right? If you go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, you go to Hebrews uh, 10, verse 38, you're going to find the same wording, all right? So, so uh, Paul in Galatians and the writer of Hebrews is also quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, okay? So what are we getting at? That we're saying that in Romans 1, 17, uh, we're saying in, in Hebrews 10, 38, Galatians 3, 11, we're saying that there's a theme here, okay? And that this, this statement that just shall live by faith is actually a central doctrinal statement key to our Christian faith, and key to the doctrine of justification by, uh, by grace through faith in Christ. So to be justified then means that we're brought into a right relationship with God for Christ's sake. Okay? Even, even right. though we don't deserve it. Yeah, but it's a, it, when we don't deserve it, but there's still an action on our part. Yes. Okay, and that action is not a work necessarily, but it's an action on our part when we put our trust in Jesus Christ Amen. to be our Lord and Savior. Amen. So when we accept what He has done, He, Christ, has done for us, then God counts it as righteousness unto mm, us. Yes. Okay? Yes. All right, so <clears throat> think about this for a moment. If we look in verses 18 down through verse 23 of this first chapter, we see uh, there, there, most, most of you have a, a heading in your Bible. Mine says, God's anger at sin. Okay? When we look at this, we understand that in this passage of Scripture that we are all alienated from God, all humans. Amen. When I say we, I mean all humans, Jew Correct. or Gentile. Correct. Because the Bible sees two people groups, Jew or right. Gentile. All humans are alienated from God because right. of sin. sin and our sin nature. So then we all have a sin problem. Correct. All of us, Correct. Jew or Gentile. Okay. So... How can we escape the dominion of sin over us so that we can be brought into a right relationship with God who is holy? How can we escape that? How can we get from underneath the sin problem? Only through the blood of Christ. Only through the blood of Christ. Now, now I want to read this statement. The answer to this dilemma is God himself will save us from sin 
for Christ's sake. Okay? All right? Okay. When we put trust in Christ to save us from our sin, then God saves us by grace. In other mm -hmm. words, unmerited favor. Yes. All right? Yes. Why? Because Christ died for us, died for our sins, and not did he only die, but he resurrected. Again, yes. that's why the, the resurrection is so important. Right. Okay? All right, so he's resurrected. So he, he, he's uh, died for our sin. He rose from the dead so that he could accomplish that purpose, to give us salvation from sin and from everlasting life. Uh, let me take a, si a sidebar here for a moment. It's not in the notes. Think about this. All right, in the Old Testament law, what did the Jew offer for sin sacrifice? A blood right. sacrifice. Right. All right, blood had to be applied. God accepted yes. the animal blood yes. as a covering. All right, but they had to repeatedly do sacrifices Correct. over and over again because Correct. they repeatedly sin. Sin. All right. So Jesus Christ came in the incarnation. He came in human flesh, divinity coming into human form. Yes. He lived in all. Now get this. Get this. He lived all his life in human flesh yes. without a sin nature. Yes. Yes. He had a divine nature. Yes. Without sin, which allows him to be tempted in all ways like us. Amen. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that he was tempted into every sin, but he was tempted into the categories of sin. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. So well, you're going into heresy. No, I'm not either. <laughs> Think about this. What are the categories of sin? There's three. The lust of the eye, the lust, lust of, of the, the flesh, flesh and, and what? The, the pride, the of, pride life. of life. Right. So Christ was tempted in all those three major areas of sin. Yes. And all of them exampled in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Mm -hmm. Think about it. The flesh. Yep. Hunger, thirst. Yep. Okay. Showed him all the kingdoms of the heaven. Ah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. What was the other one? Pride of life. All right. So all those temptations were given. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, what did he do? How did Jesus respond to those, that massive attack of the enemy upon his spirit and mind? Scripture. Scripture. All right. But notice, isn't he the word? He is the word. He is the word. He right. not only quoted a word, he, is he quoted word. himself because yes. he is the word. <laughs> Okay, so he is the power. And so when we look at justification by grace through faith in Christ, really, we, we, we think it's so complicated, but it's really not. It is so simple yes. that many people stumble over it yes. and regard it as unacceptable. Why? Because people want to earn Come on. salvation or Come they on. feel like they deserve salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, but this can't be done. So look over at chapter 3, and let's look at verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. In other words, why do you think Paul put that in there? Why did he not put that period somewhere else up there uh, 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 without keeping the requirements of the law, period, instead of comma? Why did he put that as promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets? Because he wanted them to remind them that God had said all the way through from the mm -hmm. prophets, all the way from the beginning, he'd always made this promise it was coming, a Messiah's coming. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right? So notice it says, uh, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Yes. That, in, that, in that day, that meant whether you're a Gentile or whether or you're a Jew. Jew. That's okay? correct. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Amen. Okay? 323, one of the first verses in the Roman road. Verse 24, yet God, with undeserved <laughs> kindness, declares... Yeah that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. So when we look at this, people 
Justification is really, really simple. Yes. Okay? But they think it's not because they feel as if they've been, whether they feel it, whether they've been taught it, whether they've lived it, whether they assume it, they feel like they earn, they have to earn their salvation or uh, the opposite yeah. of that is that it must be given to them because they right. deserve it. Right. Again, that's all based on works. Yes. It's all yes. based on works. So when we look at this, we understand that the provision that God has made for our salvation from sin is the righteousness that results from our trusting in Christ for our salvation. Amen. In other words, it's not self-righteousness. Come on, come on. We're not, we're not trusting in ourselves. We're trusting in Christ. So that is the result. So the self-righteousness is not based on our good deeds. It's based on, now get this, it's based on the righteousness of Christ being credited to us. In other words, okay. the word there means imputed yes. to us. Okay, yes. But it's also given to us. So it's credited to us, imputed. It's also given or imparted. Yes. So it's both imputed and imparted to us. All right. All right. That sounds all uh, fine and good. But what does that mean? It means that this righteousness is not of us. Correct. It's of Christ. Exactly. God is not obligated or in other words, he is not indebted Amen. to give us Amen. righteousness. OK, that's Romans four, chapter uh, four, verses three through five. Here's the thing. We are indebted. We, in other words, we yes. are obligated yes. to God yes. for the gift of His grace, which is the righteousness of Christ in us. Even though yeah. God created us, He gave us, He created us with a choice. With a choice. And this is what we have to, yeah. to stand and on. And man choose, that choice. chose in the garden, and he chose wrong. Right. Okay? And we bear the consequences for that. That is correct. Thus, we need a Savior. Amen. So, that is that we understand the first part being made right with God is that the just shall live by faith. Part two is, is that we understand that we have been justified by that faith. Amen. So when we look at Romans chapter five, verse one, it says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Christ Jesus, our Lord has done for us. Okay. Uh, I can't help it. Sidebar. <laughs> Go ahead. If we, in the midst of what we're going through this week in our nation, the elections and COVID and resurgence and restrictions and fighting over this and fighting over that and violence here and all that, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you truly understood verse one right here, you wouldn't have anxiety. You wouldn't have fear. Notice, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God. Come on, Mr. Wright. If you know who he is, Woo! then you're not going to be worried about all this ancillary things because we are a citizen of a different kingdom. Glory. Now, yes, we are to occupy, but that doesn't mean that we have to be fearful. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to make ourselves sick worrying about these things, okay? Because he says... For what Christ Jesus, our Lord, has done for us. Now, notice, he's done it for us. Amen. Well, you said, well, wait a minute. That's things in the past. Uh-uh. He's done it and accomplished it, not only for us then, but for us now and for us in the future. Amen. It's all done. Yes. It's yes. all done. <laughs> Even 10 years from now, what I may experience is already covered. Hallelujah. It's already paid for, already done. Preach, Mr. So, Rush. Preach. Notice now that God is not indebted to us, but that we are indebted to amen, Him. Amen, okay? amen. Now, notice that uh, in verses 6 through 8, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Amen, now, amen. most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some, someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still, still sinners. sinners. Amen. You know, the thought is in the human realm, well, maybe you die 
for somebody who was upright or righteous or mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 somebody that's well loved and, and, and understood. But Jesus didn't do that. No. He came and died for all of us. Right. Okay. While we're still sinners. So practically, what results from being justified or being made right with God by grace through faith in Christ is that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So being at peace with God means that we're also at peace with ourselves yes. and with each other. Amen. Okay? Amen. So if we truly, that's what I was getting at a moment ago, if we <laughs> truly understand who Jesus is and our relationship with him, Come on. then if we have peace with him, then we can have peace with ourselves. Yes, we can. And we can have peace with each other. Amen. And we can be an example to unbelievers yes. Yes. who don't know where to turn in the midst mm -hmm. of all this chaos. Right. We can stand as light and assault in Thank this you. time and be a, 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 a draw to others. That How in the correct. world can you have peace right now, Pastor Rush? How in the world can you have peace right now, Delmer? Why, why is it that, that you can act this way and <laughs> seem like is, there's no real concern? Woo. Because we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because my peace is not, yeah. does not come from this world. It, right. Here's another way of saying it. All peace and peaceableness and peacemaking are our part as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? It all flows. That peace, that peaceableness and peacemaking all flows from the peace we have with God amen, through our salvation amen, with Jesus Christ. Amen. So think about what God has done for you through Christ. Wow. Mm. Another way of saying it in verse 6 in the King James says, I've already read it in the New Living, but King James says that God has commended his love toward us in that while we were yet, yet sinners, sinners, Christ died for us. Right. That's truly amazing. Think Amen. about it. In view of the fact that few people would be willing to die for a righteous or good person, Christ willingly gave himself up for all people all right, as sinners. Irregardless yeah. of who they were. Irregardless. Christ died for the ungodly. Yes. Yes. The fact that Christ died for our sins is foundational to the Christian Amen. doctrine of atonement. Amen. Amen. All right. Here is atonement. Mm. At one meant. Okay. Amen. Atonement. So Christ died for us. That is the foundation of the atonement. In other words, the atonement is how, where God reconciles us to himself through Christ. Amen. Okay. Now, because we are reconciled to God in peace by Christ, that's chapter 5, verse 1 I read to you, then that means we're freed from the condemnation of sins. That then means that if we're free from the condemnation of sin, then that we live by a new power and a new motivation. Mm -hmm. Okay, That is, we are not going to live or conduct our lives the way we always have. Right. Okay, We're not going to conduct it in the ways and the desires of the flesh, those three categories I mentioned, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We're not going to walk in that way. Okay. In other words, what we're saying is that we're going to walk and conduct ourselves according to the Holy Word and the unction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. And so notice what it says in chapter 8, verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Verse 2. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, has freed you from the power of the sin that leads you to death. Verse 3 goes on further to say that the, the, the law of Moses only led you into the weakness of your sinful nature because it only exposed to you that you were a sinner. Okay. Now, mm. think about this for a moment. There are 7.5 billion people on the earth right. who do not live most of that 7.5 billion people on the earth, most of them do not live in a right relationship with God. Right. That fact alone reveals how greatly it is needed to share the gospel message about justification. In Amen. other words, being brought yeah. into a right relationship with 
God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All the more reason for the Great Commission. Amen. All the more reason to finish the Great Commission, and that's an emphasis in the Church of God, is to finish the Great Commission. It's not just doing the Great Commission. We actually can finish it in yeah. our lifetime. Amen, we can. We can finish it. Okay. The number of unreached people groups is smaller and smaller every day. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, most people live sinfully and do so willfully and intentionally. And what does that result in? Death. Something else first. <laughs> yeah. Misery first, right? Yeah. Amen. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> okay, Deep, yeah. dark depression, excess misery. Yeah, all right, I'm dating myself. All right, misery. Okay, and what does misery lead to? Death. Right. There is only one way out for every person, mm -hmm. and that is by hearing, believing, and accepting the gospel message. The way out of bondage to sin, the way out of bondage to death, is justification by faith in the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Now, let's flip to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verses 1 through 11, we see where Paul and Apollos are talking, and he's, he's dealing with them and, and uh, the Corinthians, and, and he's, he's kind of, in verse 3, to verse 2, he says, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food. In other words, they were immature baby Christians, mm -hmm. and he had mm -hmm. to go softly. And we see that during his second missionary journey between A.D. 50 and 52, Paul had ministered in Corinth for 18 months. So for a year and a half of those two years, he was in Corinth, and he ministered. And it's, it's talked about in several places uh, throughout the Bible. You can look at Acts chapter 18. Five years later, near the end of ministering for three years in the city of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and, verse 20, and chapter 20, we see that Paul wrote... Uh, to the Corinthians, the letter we call 1 Corinthians. Now, technically, it's probably 2 Corinthians, and uh, uh, he wrote at least four letters to the Corinthians. We have probably 2 and 4 Corinthians, uh, what we call our 1 and 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians, the letter reveals that during the five years since Paul had departed from Corinth, that there had been many spiritual uh, and moral weaknesses among the Chris mm -hmm. uh, Corinthian Christians there, uh, and and uh, Paul had to um, write and deal with these. And when he learned of the weaknesses, he took it upon himself as the apostle. That's why, if you notice right here, I've got apostolic correction. Right? He is an uh, the, he is the apostle. He's the founding apostle of mm -hmm. that church. Mm -hmm. He's the one that brought the message of Christ to that city of darkness and idol worship and sexual immorality, and we see that he writes. He takes it upon himself. Okay, he learned of these weaknesses. He's the apostle, but more than that, he's the founder of the church. He right. started the church. Okay, he takes ownership of that. And he wants to deal with the corrections and, and deal with the issues and bring corrections. So he writes this letter of correction and counsel to the Christians at Corinth. After Paul's departure from Corinth in A.D. 52, sectarian divisions had grown up among mm -hmm. them. Sectarian means there were divisions. Mm -hmm. Some said, I'm of Paul. Some said, I'm of Peter. Some said, I'm of Paul. Some said, I'm of Christ. You know? uh, so those were those sectarian divisions. And that was really causing serious issues in the church. So uh, Paul and others, uh, the apostle Apollos, uh, and, and the, even the apostle Peter and others, they were boasting how they followed them as their key leader. And really they said, you know, and then some said, well, you're all wrong. I'm a follower of Christ. And they boasted in that. So mm -hmm. in boasting, they were boasting incorrectly. But Paul said that this sectarian rivalry between the Christians in Corinth had really revealed their spiritual in, in yes. immaturity yes. and their carnality. Yes. And so Paul rebuked uh, the evil, calling on the Corinthians to recognize that all believers in Christ are laborers together with God. Amen. And that was the founding passage of Scripture for World Outreach Worship Center. Pastor Collins, right. when we formed in uh, January of 1974, mm -hmm. uh, that was a foundational scripture, is that we are co-laborers together with God. And that was even put in uh, glass in, right. our, in our first building. Now, when we look at this, if you flip over to Galatians chapter 1, 
and look at verse four, 1 through 14, we talk about where Paul is greeting them. But in verse 6, he said, there is only one good news. There's only one message. In other words, that's, that's Romans uh, uh, re, uh, 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 in miniature. Uh, he's giving the doctrinal message that you only have faith through the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, reconciliation, restoration with God through faith in Christ. But in, when he's, when he, uh, in, in uh, Galatians, we see that the Apostle Paul was accompanied by Barnabas, and he ministered, the two of them ministered in the area of Galatia in Asia Minor, which we would now say is Western Turkey. And he did that on his first missionary journey between A.D. 48 and 49. Um, also, he ministered during their, uh, uh, well, excuse me, while he was on his second missionary journey between 50 and 52 A.D., uh, while at Corinth, he wrote the letter to Galatians, uh, to the Galatians in A.D. 52. So during the two years since Paul had ministered in Galatia from 49 A.D. when he left to 52 when he wrote the letter, in that two-year period, we see that uh, false teachers had been working, had visited mm -hmm. the cities and the areas, the churches of Galatia, and these false teachers had come in and uh, working, and they were really trying to uh, uh, persuade the Galatian Christians that in addition to faith in Jesus, they also had to embrace the rituals and the uh, uh, ceremonies of the Old Testament Judaism. So in other words, they were trying to say, in addition to your faith in Christ, you've got to be, be obedient to the law and not just the moral law, uh -huh. but the ritual and ceremonial law. In other words, they were pushing Judaism on them, right. whether they were Jew or Gentile. Okay? And so uh, this is a direct contradiction to the decision yes. of the early church in A.D. 50, uh, where Gentile believers in the Lord Jesus Christ would not be required to convert to Judaism to be accepted in the church. Okay, This is Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. So in writing to the Galatians, Paul set forth briefly the doctrine of justification, just like he did in Romans. He sets forth this doctrine by, faith, or by grace through faith in Christ, and he later writes this. He, so Galatians is written before Romans. Remember that. We said that earlier. He wrote First and Second Thessalonians, then Galatians. All right, so a year later, he writes Romans. Okay? But he starts in, initially. He brings up the initial doctrine of justification in the letter to the Galatians five years before he wrote Romans. Okay? All right? So he brings this up. And he lets them know, and he writes about it more extensively in Romans, but he brings up this doctrine, and he's saying that justification, in other words, justification and salvation are used synonymously, and it means salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot be obtained by observing mere rituals, Amen. ceremonies, holy days, or doing good deeds. And that's what he's saying in these 14 verses, but I will read... Uh, chapter 3, verse 11. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, now this is Galatians, the first book, one of the first books he wrote, and the scriptures that he had at the time are the Old Testament, okay? For the scriptures say it is through faith that a person has life. All right, where is he quoting that from? In verse 11. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Okay, all right. So he's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting the prophet Habakkuk. Okay, so when we look at this, we're understanding that, that, that he, he, he is t telling the church that you must, in order to gain salvation, you must have faith by grace. You're saved by grace through Your faith. faith. In Correct. the Lord Jesus Christ. Correct. I always want to flip that for some reason in my mind. <laughs> right. Now, when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy saying in 2 Timothy 3.16, another verse probably mm -hmm. all of you have recognized, mm -hmm. all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, or correction, instruction in righteousness. Correct. Okay. All right. So when he says that all scripture, when Paul wrote to Timothy, and he wrote to Timothy several years later from the, from the time he wrote these books, 
what scriptures again is he referring to? Oh. He's referring to the Old Testament. Correct. Okay? All right. So what he wrote then now applies to the letters of the New Testament. Correct. Okay. All right. That he wrote and others wrote in the New Testament. So all of the Apostle Paul's writings are full of explanation of Christian doctrine and are full of instructions for Christian living. If you've sat in any time under any of my teaching, whether it's in school of ministry or Wednesday night, you've learned this point from me, that when Paul writes, he doesn't just give you the doctrinal, but he also gives you the practical. He will tell you what the doctrinal, the theology, but then he's going to tell you how, the practical, how you walk out that theology in your everyday living. Right. That's what I just said when, he said when I said that we've got the doctrinal. He always gives the doctrinal and he gives instructions for Christian living. In other words, you not only get the head and the heart knowledge, but he tells you how to walk it out right. in your daily living. Right. Okay. So then we do well to continually read and study the letters of the Apostle Paul so that we will know what we believe as Christians. Mm -hmm. So that in your challenge, you know what to do, you know what to say, you know where, you, where you're going. Okay, so we need, to, we need to know what we believe, we need to know why we believe it, and how to live it out the way we believe it. Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. Now let's look at go back to First Corinthians chapter fifteen. We're going to wrap this lesson up. Now the third point of the lesson is the significance of the resurrection. The significance of the resurrection. We mentioned this a moment ago, looking at the first part. If Jesus Christ is the only way to obtain salvation, then what do you think is the significance of the resurrection? Ponder that for a moment. If Jesus had not resurrected, yeah, 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 yeah. what effect does it have on your faith? It would have an, a profound effect. Absolutely. Upon it because we'd be serving a dead Savior. Yes, yes, yes. Just like everybody else, all other world religions, they're living. Yes. They're, they're living, serving a God that is dead. Right, right. We know where they're buried. Right. We know where Jesus arose from. Mm -hmm. We know where he was buried. And we also know where he arose from. And we also know where he lives now. Amen. In your heart, Amen. if you trust in him. Yes. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15... It is the longest written document passage about the doctrine of the resurrection in the entire Bible. Okay, so as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, our confidence that we will be resurrected from the dead to everlasting life with Christ is based on the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead by God. That's verses 12 through 16 of this chapter. Now, Without the fact of Jesus' resurrection, our faith is vain, and we're still in our sins, and yep. that then means we have no hope of resurrection. <coughs> if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we have no hope to rise from the dead. Right. Okay? Right. All right? So, those believers in Christ who have died, who are expecting to be raised from the dead, then have truly perished. Yeah. That means they yeah. have no hope in the resurrection. Right. Right. Okay. All right. If that were true. Verse 19 does not mean that living for Christ is miserable. Let's look at verse 19. 15, 19. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Mm. Okay. If you don't, if, if Christ did not die and we're living this lifestyle, he says, we're just pitiful. We're just pitiful. In other words, what are we trying to say? We're saying that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the vital heart of the gospel and our Christian faith. It is the culmination of it all. Yep, it is. Without the fact of his resurrection, our faith is vain. We're still in our sins and we have no hope. Right. And, and those who've died have no hope. They've truly perished. It means uh, that if... Um, if we have the blessings for living of living for Christ, 
with no hope in, in, in a, that our life in Christ would go on forever, then he says, Paul says, we're of all men most miserable. Right. Okay? right. In other words, if that were the case, if, mm -hmm. conditional word, Correct. if. Correct. But that's not the case. What Paul says is he's doing comparison here. Right. Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead with eternal life, never to die again. Thus, verse 20, it says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. King James says he is the first of the first fruits. Right. He's the first fruit right. of the first fruits. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, verse 23 says, but there is an order to this uh, resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Okay. All right. So then... Like the first fruits of the harvest signif uh, signify that the harvest is about to follow, death came by Adam, okay, all right, in the garden. But all who have faith in Christ will live with him forever. So Christ brings resurrection life. So believers in, who, uh, in Christ who are still living when he comes back, in the latter portion of this chapter, verse 51 and 52, he says, will be changed in a moment and they will join the resurrected believers with Christ. Yes. Okay. So looking at 52 through 58 of this chapter, we understand the nature of our resurrection. Because of the Greek cultural background, the Corinthians had been influenced by Greek philosophy to believe in a disembodied existence after death a disembodied, a spirit existence. Therefore, their pre-Christian or before Christian concept of resurrection was that of corpses walking in decaying bodies. <laughs> Paul's explanation of the resurrection of verses 53, 54 was completely opposite of the Greek version of the uh -huh. living dead. <laughs> okay, all right. Paul said that for believers in Christ, their, their resurrection or change at Christ's coming will be totally complete and permanent victory over death. Okay? Mm. Now think about this. The great appeal of the gospel has always been the promise to those who believe in Christ yes. as their Savior and their Lord. That promise is freedom from the dominion of sin in, their, in this life and the promise of everlasting life right. in the future in eternity okay so simply stated this is the promise of the best life we can have in this imperfect world amen okay uh, and the promise of an endless and glorious life with Christ where I, then uh, our life here then is no more okay? our, our sinless life our with sinless Christ. life so as a believer in Christ uh, that is what we have to offer to all people uh, when we proclaim the gospel. Amen. We're giving them hope. Right. So, when God calls us by His Word, by His Holy Spirit, to come follow Christ, we've all had that call. Those of us that, uh, that are in the room, those of us that are watching or watching at a later time, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you, you've had God call you. Amen. You're, you're, oh, yes. the Holy, the, yes. Either the Word convicted you, the Holy Spirit convicted you, a friend led you to Christ. Okay? But what is He doing? The Holy Spirit's calling us into a right relationship with Himself. Mm -hmm. When we come into that relationship, that results in right kind of living in this current life. Yes. Okay? So we need to receive very thankfully, and we need to receive very joyfully every day God's call Hallelujah. to our life to Hallelujah. follow Hallelujah. Jesus Christ Amen. every day. So, think about this. What is your destiny as believers in Christ? Amen. What Amen. is your destiny? Your destiny is to live as believers with Him forever. Amen. All right? So, because of that, then we need to continually encourage one another yes. to hang in there, to be steadfast, to be immovable. Don't let the, the fear, the anxiety, the unknown or the fear of the unknown move you to not have faith in Christ. We need to be immovable. We need to work abundantly to show the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what's, what I said earlier, 
He is our peace. And if we know who he is, then we'll walk in the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word says we can even encourage ourselves in yeah. the Lord yeah. with his word. Yeah. And let's sum it up in the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. It says, So, dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically yes. for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Hallelujah. We have a purpose, and it will be rewarded amen, one day. Amen, amen, Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word mm. today. I Hallelujah, thank you, Father, Lord. for, yes. for uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Lord. Uh, and this lesson's part one. Next week, we're going to look at parts two in Colossians, Ephesians, and Thessalonians, and even to Timothy. And, and Lord, mm. how that... You Hallelujah. love us. You've established uh, uh, a relationship yes. through your son, Jesus Christ. Yes. It's so simple. Help mm. us never to make it complicated. Help us to Thank understand the Lord. simplicity, Lord. It's just by faith, by believing in what Jesus has done for me yes, Lord. that I have eternal life. Thank you so much for that. I pray, Lord, that you would enable us as believers, that we will not walk in fear, we'll not walk in anxiety. Oh, God. Father, Lord, that we will walk in trust, that we will walk in hope, yes, we'll Lord. walk in faith, we'll walk in belief mm. in you. You are our Savior. Yes, You've Lord. never broken a promise, and you never will. And Father, you will sustain us, you will keep us. And Father, Lord, help us to keep us mm. focused in yes, forward Lord. ministry, to tell others to be yes, a witness Lord. and a light, Father, to somebody mm. else, so that they may know Jesus. Father, in the dark time, may we be light so others will yes. be drawn to us. Yes, we Lord. give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 All right. The Lord bless you. We'll see you next week.